Good morning. Happy almost Veterans Day. Happy Lord's Day. We're ready to worship. And uh, if you see me running on out a little bit here at the very beginning of the service, we're working on a technical thing that you'll be surprised at if it works. If it doesn't work, well then, nothing to be surprised about. <laughs> Father, we're going to worship you today. We're going to praise your name. We're going to be thankful. And most of all, Father, we're just going to expect you to come into our hearts and our lives anew and afresh as we begin this another week. Be with us today. Amen. that would work for veterans today since we're honoring them. And so I'm going to read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. 
Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials that you are enduring. Our Father, we bring our tithes and offerings unto you in furtherance of your kingdom, Lord. We pray that you would bless these, our givings, Lord, that they will reach those that need to hear your gospel, Lord. We pray that we would be good stewards of what we give and how we use this money, Lord. We love you and thank you for all that you have done for us, all your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Almighty God, 
we give you thanks today for our nation's veterans. We honor them for their faithful service in defending and preserving our freedom. We are grateful to those who served during times of peace. Standing ready, bravely awaiting their call to duty. We are grateful to those who served during times of unrest. Enduring conflict and bearing the physical and spiritual wounds of war. We ask that you bless them, heal their wounds, and give them peace. We thank you, God, for all our veterans, those of generations past and present. May we never forget what our country has asked of them and what they have given in return. Amen. I'm trying something here. Um, we have some men in our church that uh, have served, and we want to honor them today. And uh, Kurt, can you hit the OK button for that TV right there to allow? Trying to bring Perry in for a live feed, and we are having some interesting situations with that right now. Not worth the way. Pardon? Okay, let me try again. Anyhow, uh, let me start with the youngest first and work my way up. Uh, I remember when uh, Stephen Brack went into the Marines, it was a, you're gonna do what? Because he was working for us out at the uh, campgrounds and uh, uh, it was a personal to me, oh no, I need to find a new employee. Plus, I spent a lot of time with Stephen. And uh, he went to the Marines. And uh, Stephen, I think you're probably online at home. And uh, yeah, Kurt, go ahead and hit that. So it'll allow it with the remote. Should have just hit the OK button. OK, just a second here. Just a second here. When technology works, it works. When it doesn't work, some of you are thoroughly enjoying this. I can tell. Anyhow, uh, Stephen, we want to thank you for your service and honor you. And uh, I have a gift here for each of you. Uh, it is veterans, thank you, God, may God bless you all. And uh, Warren, you're going to really like what's in this uh, cup because uh, it's all the things you shouldn't have but that taste good. And uh, I'm sure Stephen will enjoy this too. Uh, here, Cheryl, you can just take this to him. And we'll go from there. Um, Dan Medish served in the Navy uh, in a submarine. And if you're interested in some interesting stories, talk to Dan. He can, there, it's gonna go over there maybe. Uh, he can tell you some interesting stories Oh, heaven help us, who knows what's playing. 
Uh, he can tell you some very interesting stories. And uh, I think Rachel can too. And uh, Dan, we thank you for your service. And uh, you're, you're, you can walk up here. I could have made sure to walk up here too. Okay, we're going to try something here, see if it works. You're welcome. Okay. We're going to see if Lolly answers the phone here and if it will go up there on my... Nope. Okay, I am looking at Perry, and I'm going to see if we can get you up on the screen here, Perry, with... Uh, it may not work real well. Well... Something's not working right, but can you hear me, Perry? Can you hear me, Perry? Well, I am looking at Perry and Lolly. And uh, Perry, Lolly has a cup for you that we had shipped direct to your house. And uh, uh, there's only one difference between your cup and everybody else's cup is yours doesn't have candy in it. So Lolly, you need to go out and buy him a bunch of candy and put in his cup. Uh, Perry served in the Army, uh, I think, as a first lieutenant. And Perry, we thank you for your service as well very much. Uh, I'm going to leave you on here for a couple minutes so you can hear, and then I'm going to have to hang up. But uh, Mel Green served in the Army. Uh, you were in the Navy. Yeah. Uh, Mel served in the Army, uh, and he had a... Very interesting job in secret communications. secret communications, Philippines or Thailand? Thailand. Thailand. And uh, he, uh, he had a good time in Thailand, I think. But Mel, it uh, doesn't matter what you did in the service, it was very important. And uh, Mel has some interesting stories of his days there in Thailand. And Mel, we thank you for your service as well. Warren served in the Army, and uh, I can't remember where you were stationed at, Warren, but here's a present for you. It's a coffee mug, and it's, it's full of candy. There's Reese's Pieces in there and all kinds of things, and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy the contents as well and probably drinking coffee out of that as well. And Warren, we thank you for your service, and it's really great to have you in church today. It's, it's, we're thrilled to have you here today. And uh, Paula, thank you for bringing him. Uh, we're going to have just a quick word of prayer here and then uh, go on with our worship service. Father, we just want to thank you today for uh, people who have been willing to serve down through the years and for uh, all they mean to us and all uh, they mean to you. And Father, we just pray for each person that we've honored today that uh, you continue to be with them in their lives continue being close to them, and as they serve in many different capacities now, whether it's just being a prayer warrior or an active participant in things, that you'll always be with them. Amen.
Father, what a testimony to be able to sing. It is well with our souls. It's all because of your grace. It's all because of your mercy. It's all because of your sacrifice. And Father, we thank you today for paying the price for us. Today, Father, we've come into worship with great expectations. And, and Father, I look at the technical issues we've had and a, another little building issue earlier this morning, and it just tells me that we're on the right track because the other guy's fighting. Father, we're here to worship you, to praise your name, to let your glories come down around us, and to not only be able to sing as well with our souls, but to know it deep within inside of us because you reign in this world and in our lives. Father, today, we think of those not able to be in your house, people who are ill, people who are going through some pretty rough times right now, people, Father, who just need to be reminded of your grace. And Father, they're online with us today. They're praising you. They're hearing and feeling what we're feeling, your presence. So, Father, speak to our people today. Lift them up. Encourage their hearts. Heal them, Father, physically. Keep their emotions intact. Keep their spirits pointing to you. Father, I'm thinking of some others right now that have some things coming down in the next week or two. People, Father, that might be half scared to death. People, Father, who just need to stay very close to you, keep in touch with you. Father, remind each and every one of us of your love. Today, Father, as we continue worshiping, as we open your word, as we prepare to go out into this world for another week, give us what we need to be your people in this world. Amen.
about a thousand years ago, when I was a young single youth pastor, uh, our district up in Michigan had an alternative to prom because good Nazarene kids didn't drink, dance, smoke, or date kids who did. And this alternative was called Night on Niagara. And we would gather at um, a gymnasium in Port Huron, Michigan, and have a very fancy formal dinner, or semi-formal dinner. And then the kids would change clothes, and the adults would too, and we would have a gym time. And then about uh, 1 a.m., we boarded buses, crossed over into Canada, and went to Niagara Falls. Now, as you're driving up to Niagara Falls, you begin to see this thing. And you wonder, what in the world is that? Uh, it, it, you know, you hold your finger up, you know, and it's about the size of a toothpick from a distance. But as you're driving and you get closer to it, you begin to realize how big this thing really is. And it overlooks Niagara Falls and, and uh, the whole big area there. And one thing they told us is, we're eating lunch up there. Or breakfast, I mean, up there. Well, as we took this quick elevator ride up near the top, we get to this observation deck. Now, keep in mind, this observation deck goes all the way around that thing, and it's huge. I mean, they have all kinds of things to do up there, and brochures, all kinds of stuff, advertising things in the area. But then the next stop is the restaurant. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this restaurant revolves real slow. And so your view is constantly changing while you're up there. And uh, one thing I want to tell you is that the restrooms are in the middle and they don't move. And if you go to the restroom, uh, you may discover that your seat has moved when you come back out. I, I did just, just trust me on that one. But as you're sitting there, viewing the scenery changing around you, you begin to understand the layout of the city, uh, the falls, uh, Canada, and, and Buffalo, New York, and, and how everything fits together and, and relates to each other. Now, I've shared all that to say this. When you get into the higher things of God, you begin to understand the place of God in your life through Jesus Christ. You begin to understand the amazing things that are in your life and your place in the great big family of God. With the Ephesians, it was not by accident that they begin to understand these things. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, shares how pleased he is with the news that the Ephesus people were growing in their faith and their love for each other and how he is praying for them. Look at Ephesians 1.17 with me. And it begins to tell us uh, about Paul's prayer and what he's praying for the people. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Two key words there, spirit of wisdom and revelation. I find wisdom elsewhere in the Bible. Look at James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Now, I often ask God for some wisdom. And in fact, in fact, I was laying in bed awake at about 3 o'clock this morning saying, Lord, give me some wisdom how to deal with such and such. The wisdom here in James is the wisdom to have the smarts to deal with daily life. Father, I need to know how to handle this thing. Give me the smarts to know what to do. Give me the wisdom how to handle it. Now, in John chapter 12, we find this statement. Although Jesus had performed many signs in their presence, they still did not believe in him. 
This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Now, giving the understanding of the things of God because they didn't, they, they were not given the understanding of the things of God because they didn't believe that Jesus came from God. And if they were to start understanding these things, they would only argue and not give the God the glory when he is due, that he is due. But here in Ephesians, I believe, we find a reversal of this situation that's referred to in John back talking about Isaiah. And so we find this reversal giving the people wisdom and revelation in understanding the things of God. That has nothing to do with the wisdom of, Lord, I need to know how to handle this situation. It's the wisdom and revelation of knowing about God. Our ears are no longer blocked. Our minds are no longer blocked. Our hearts are no longer blocked. And verse 17, if you noticed, ends with these words. I'm dead here, Kurt, all of a sudden. Ends with these words, so that you may know him better. And so God opens up and he gives us all of this mental ability and understanding to know about him so we can know him better so we can understand him better. Now, you know, when you get that understanding, your brain is just like the light came on. All of a sudden, the light came on. Now, I can remember years ago, I was doing night watch at boys camp, about a thousand years ago again, young, single youth pastor. And uh, I was staying in a camper that I could see most of the campgrounds from. And so I'd go to bed about four in the morning and once in a while I would hear something and I'd just kind of wake up and look out the window and you'd see things moving in the dark. You know, things go bump in the night. You take a flashlight and go out and there's nothing there. Or when the light would come on, you would realize that it was a light pole that's sitting there by itself, not moving. The light comes on and you understand what you're looking at. Now, if you go back into Ephesians and you slide into uh, verse 18, you find Paul saying, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. So this wisdom and revelation comes so that the eyes of our heart can be enlightened. We can begin to understand the deeper things of God. Now, in biblical terms, the heart represents the innermost core of a person, encompassing our thoughts and our emotions and our intentions. It goes beyond just mere emotions and it includes moral character and reasoning and decision-making. Our, our heart, in the biblical terms, is the control center from which all of our thoughts and passions and decisions flow. It, it, it's conveying the total of part of our inner self. It's talking about love and devotion and surrendering to God's will for spiritual transformation. And so basically, the prayer is to give us a fresh new understanding of God. And verse 18 finishes with these words, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of the glorious inheritance in his holy people those who believe. Uh, last week we spoke about God's power in Ephesians 3.20 and how God can do more than we can ever imagine. And probably should have preached this message first and that one afterwards, but that's okay. Here we find Paul's prayer for us to understand the hope that we have in Christ, the inheritance we have in Christ, and the power that we have in Christ. Not just to hear about it, 
not just to have book learning about it, but to understand it in the depths of our being. Uh, we've got some people around here that some, have some amazing stories to tell. Some things that have happened this week where, where God was involved in it, and it's, it's because of his power, because of what we've inherited him, because of the hope that we had in him. And, and, and I'm hoping that those people, maybe today or maybe later, will just say, hey, here's what God did in my life. Here's how he showed his power. Here's how he worked all these things out in our lives. And it opened my heart and my mind to just understanding him a little bit more. When I begin to think of the eyes of our hearts being opened, it tells us why some people flourish in their spiritual lives and make an impact as they grow in the things of God is they become joyful encouragers to the body of Christ and their fellow Christians. Are you ready for this? Is they grow old gracefully. Let me say that again. When I think of the eyes of our hearts being opened, it tells us why some people flourish in their spiritual lives and make an impact as they grow in the things of God as they become joyful encouragers to the body of Christ, to their fellow Christians as they grow old gracefully. Other people seem to just get by, at times withering up with no joy, while they complain their way into heaven as they just grow old. I have a piece of machinery, uh, equipment for sale on uh, line. I've got it listed on uh, Facebook Marketplace and eBay and uh, Craigslist and, and uh, Kankakee Buy and Sell. And yesterday a guy sent me a note and he said, would you take X number of dollars for this thing? And it was less than half of what I was asking for. And I sent it back, boy, what a low ball price, no. And the guy sent back, he said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to lowball you. And I went, oh, the filter was off. I just blurted out what I thought. And grumbled and complained about it on the way. You see, if we don't keep the eyes of our hearts open to what God has to say, we're not going to have joy. We're going to complain our way into heaven without joy as we get old. I've asked myself this question. What makes the difference? What makes the difference between growing mature and joyful and being an encourager in the body of Christ as to being a grumbler? What makes the difference? Our understanding of who God is, the place he has in our lives, and what he has really done for us. When we understand that, that makes a difference. In just a few weeks, oh, we start the Advent season. Christmas is coming. One of the themes and messages during that time is hope. Here, we find mention of hope. Colossians 1.27 talks about the hope of the glory of God, that you may know hope. Where do we find the courage to face life's problems? In our humanness, we say, whatever the mind of a person can conceive can be achieved. We say, you can do it. Nike says, just do it. There's a book called The Power of Positive Thinking, and, and, and that will only take you so far. I've heard that phrase, and I've mentioned it before, you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I've not quite figured out how I could reach down and get a strap and pull any more than just my foot up. But I want you to think about a captain of a ship for a minute. He's tossed in the waves. He's trying to anchor his ship. He sets his anchor in the bow of the ship, but he's still tossed back and forth. He, sets the anchor on the deck, but he's still driven by the wind. He sets the anchor in near the back of the ship and he's still unsteady, but finally he throws the anchor overboard. 
And when he throws that anchor overboard, it goes down and it rests on the bottom of the sea, holding his boat in place. And it's only when it is thrown deep that it can be effective against the wind and the tide. The world encourages us to discover the power that was, uh, is within each of us. And can I suggest that it's like trying to anchor a ship without throwing the anchor overboard? But then we come to the hope that God gives. And it allows us to change and see miraculous things. And what I have to say is if you want personal change, it's not going to happen under your own power. I know that for a fact. You'll never have enough courage, enough perseverance on your own to accomplish lasting spiritual lifestyle change on your own. And so I keep asking myself this question. Will my anchor hold in the storms of life? Will you? Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds kid, we used to go fishing among other places on the Detroit River. My grandpa, every year uh, we've had to go on a fishing trip. And I remember this one year in particular when we went to the Detroit River. Uh, there's a rather strong current there. And, and my grandpa said, throw the anchor overboard. You know what? The rope wasn't long enough. And it didn't go down to the bottom of the river to where we were. And we just kept on floating downstream. You got to make sure your rope or chain is long enough and strong enough when you drop that anchor so that you're ready to go. Another thing I learned about uh, throwing an anchor overboard is give it a good tug. Make sure it's holding on to something. Make sure it's going to stay in place. We do that spiritually so that we are fastened tight to Jesus and our souls don't go anywhere. Verse 3 of that song, join us. When our eyes behold through the gathering night, the city of gold, our harbor bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore when the storms all pass forevermore. Sure. 
that's a hope that tells me that through Christ, all things are possible. I think of the air we breathe. I think of the ability to get up in the morning. Some mornings I think of that more than others. I think of the continued blessings of our relationships, our possessions, the ability to make a living, and our salvation. Ephesians 1.19 says, it all comes from the incomparably great power for all who believe. The incomparably great power for all who believe. That tells me that I have power for daily living. Every day, I'm going to come up against something that may need wisdom, that may need some guidance, that may need just some extra strong spiritual help in my life. And I have that power for daily living because of his, if, if, because of his incomparably great power for all who believe. I have power for service. And it doesn't matter if that service is just being a good testimony on the daily life. It doesn't mean if I can play the piano and sing. It doesn't mean if I, I can be an encourager uh, in, in my neighborhood or, or the assisted living I live in or, or wherever I'm at. It doesn't mean if my service is just being a good person at work. It doesn't mean if I'm cleaning the toilets at church or cutting the grass or running the sound of the media. It means I have power from God to do it to the best of my ability to bring him glory. I have power to keep pure. I read something the other day that made me think about this. It said that our new president may ban porn People were upset about that. I thought, oh, heaven help us. It needs to be banned. There's so many things out there that can get our attention and pull us away. But we have the power to stay true to our Christian commitments because of the incomparably great power that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit gives to everybody who believes. And along with that, we have power to overcome any temptation that comes our way. But I wonder at times, are we afraid of the power? If the Holy Spirit were to come down on me, will I become strange and start doing backflips and get all emotional and run the aisles and, and maybe do some shouting? Will I be expected maybe to give up my job and go to some far out place to do mission work? Or may I be telling people I'm going to stand on the street corners holding Jesus save signs? Maybe. But more likely, I will end up with a power that keeps me in his love daily and allows me to live such a holy lifestyle that those around me know something is different. What I have to tell you is that we shy away from God's power. We end up with a form of godliness without any real hope for daily living and religion can become like that job you don't like, a drudgery. A lot of our culture praises the free spirit who despite their apparent satisfaction always has a resume out looking for a new job. They're always looking for something different. Society applauds the person who leaves family and friends to go find themselves. But there's an age-old psalm, uh, Psalms 15, verse 4, remains unchanged. The person who keeps, keeps his oath, even when it hurts, will find hope in daily living. You see that? Those who keep their oath to God, even when it hurts, will find hope in the power of God. Father, today, we need your power more than ever before. We need you just to keep us going daily. We need you to help us keep our eyes on you 
first off and foremost. Do that in our lives. Amen. Mm -hmm. I just have one question. Does anybody have an amazing story to share? Just anybody at all have an amazing story to share? I think you need to. We got a call Thursday evening that Zoe's dorm was on fire. And not only her dorm, but her floor. And so I sent a message out to the church, to the ladies of the church, to immediately pray. Well, it turned out that she had to walk past the laundry room. It was a laundry mm. room, with a washing machine that was on fire. Mm. But so we got out safely, sent word back to us that all was good. I'm just thankful that God took care of us all. Amen. Um, I just want to thank everyone who prayed for my mother. Never really been sick, so it was kind of a shock when she ended up in ICU. But um, even the doctors were amazed because we had all said goodbye, and my mom said goodbye, and she was fine. She was fine. She was ready to meet Jesus. And then, like within 24 hours, she just started improving and praise the Lord. She had some issues because she was in ICU for over a week, but still, the doctors said that. For her age, that she was like a month ahead of schedule, you know, when she was recuperating. Um, she did have a, one stent put in, she was supposed to have a second one, and they said it would probably be eight weeks, and they ended up doing it, I think, in week six, because she was recuperating so well. And then my mom was also very nervous about rehab, because, you know, they wouldn't let her do any exertion when she was waiting for the second surgery. And, you know, when you're even down for a day when you're sick, it takes a while to recover. But uh, when she started rehab, she was able, you know, she said it was a breeze. So I'm just thankful that, you know, the Lord took care of her and that she's still here and her story is still continuing. Amen. Karen, I'm glad you shared that because you uh, talked to me about it 
a couple weeks ago and, uh, and uh, needed to be shared. Any other just amazing stories? Anne, it looks like you've got one. We have some other people with amazing stories, but they're their stories to tell, and uh, they're not here today, but uh, I think they'll be telling them down the road. God is on the throne. He's meeting our needs. Um, Wednesday, here's normal. Uh, next Sunday, we have been invited to join Salvage Yard for a potluck dinner at College Church, is it gonna be in the gym or that big room downstairs? There's a big room downstairs. We'll get you more information next week. It's potluck, dinner will be about 1.30 uh, next Sunday. So uh, just keep that in mind and uh, we'll be reminding you of that through this week. Yeah, yeah, potluck, yeah, yeah. Bring something to the past other than a bad cold. It's a pleasure to have Reverend Warren Smith in church today. He's uh, out at Hersher at the assisted living, and uh, I think he's making a difference out there in people's lives, just being an encouragement. Last time I came to see you, Warren, I had to look for you. You weren't in your room. You were out uh, just talking with people, and, and when I took you out of the room to go talk to you for a while, they said, bring him back, bring him back. So he's being an encourager out there. I've asked uh, Reverend Smith if he would dismiss us in prayer today. You can stay seated. Our Father, we thank you for another day that you've given us. And even more than that, we thank you for what you can do with us for that day. We thank you that we have met together as friends. We have heard from you. And we can go our way strengthened inside for anything that life may give us in this week. Thanks again, Lord. Amen. Go have a great week.